Welcome back, everyone. We are jumping into part two of our conversation from Chapel. So Dr. Hartley, would you like to get us started? Yeah, I just wanted to really pick up on something, um, Chaplain Lisa, that you said in response to the question that Jose um, just asked um, uh, about this notion of status and humility and, and, um, and the choice that Jesus made. I think that's a really key part here because one of the things I think we have to recognize when we're thinking about power and privilege is that some people have a choice and some people don't have as much choice, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think about this from a, a place of being a very privileged person overall in my life um, and ask myself, okay, then what choices do I actually have available to me to, um, to again, so, you know, sometimes to use that status, but sometimes to actually step aside, right? And, and one of the things I want to be careful of is, is, not necessarily holding the same standard for all people because not everybody has the same privilege, right? So um, I don't want this to become uh, an excuse for like stepping over people or saying, you know, every, you know, everybody should just be humble in the sense that some people already um, are already not given the same kinds of opportunities and abilities to lead and the abilities to speak into conversation. So I just think that's an important part to pull out. Um, I need to think maybe even more than um, a lot of people in this world about the the choices that I have, and therefore the cho you know the choices that I make are are consequential when it comes to this this piece about power, privilege, and um, and humbling myself uh, for the sake of others. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I think the equity piece in conversations is actually really important. Like I love that image. If you all haven't seen it yet, you can search online, but you know, the equity image, you know, shows different people standing on boxes, right? And it, it's showing um, the idea that we all don't start from the same place. Yeah. And so then what does it look like for us as leaders to actually be mindful of the equity piece, acknowledging that um, not just like with saying it, but actually like, then how do I change this? so that we actually all can come to the table or that we all can move into different kinds of privileges um, in different spaces. Because I feel like I have heard that at times for people like not feeling like they have a voice into different spaces, um, not feeling like they have access into different things. Jose, I don't know how much like you hear that and see that um, even from students as different students have conversations, but um, I know that there are privileged groups of students, right, on campus and there are others that feel um, not seen, right? There are students who feel like actually um, there are things that are against me, right? And so then what does it look like for us as administrators, as pastors, um, as student leaders to begin to consider the equity piece? How do we change this so that we all can actually be at a place where we hear the voices in an equitable way? Yeah, I... Sorry. Did you... no, 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 go ahead. Well, I was just going to say sometimes that actually means, depending on who you are, actually stepping into and stepping and and actually taking the space that's given to you to fill it. So you know, Jose's in this this great position of student leadership. Um, he he didn't have to say, well, I should humble myself and not take status. It's like, no, we we need Jose in this this position of leadership. We need him to step into that. So sometimes it's a matter of stepping aside. Sometimes it's a matter of stepping in depending mm. on kind of who you are and, and what the, you know, the community is. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, that, that's actually a great segue because in that same vein, I just at the end of verse four, a part that, that, that kind of resonates with me and that kind of plays back in my head is the line that says, forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand mm -hmm. and reimagining the way we view humility. And I feel like a lot of the times when I think of humility and, and maybe just humility and leadership, it's like, oh, well, maybe don't talk about yourself so much or maybe don't think about yourself too much, but rather reimagining humility in a way that's like, how about we reimagine humility to view it as a selfless act where we're working for others and there's a working element to it rather than just a complacent element. Because rather, I think of humility, well, or I've been cultured to think of humility as maybe being complacent in the way that I view myself or maybe the view uh, complacent in the way that I view the position I hold but humility is actually an invitation to work to to be an active participant in the work of the spirit. So I just think it's interesting in how can we view humility in our positions at SPU. And, and I think we, I mean, even in this conversation, just the diversity in it, right? I mean, where power and privilege has been exclusively held for white, white men with property and power. I think right now that we're holding positions to where 
we have to view it as our responsibility to be active agents in that work in uh, representing the, pe the people and in, in places that have been under oppression. And I think uh, something that has been resonating with me pretty constant, like pretty repeatedly is the fact that how can I be more than just representation for a group and actually work towards the liberation? Because there's, there's no correlation with just being representative, but there's like an extra element added to it. And how can I work with also being in this position, but also re reworking this position because I too can be complacent in white supremacy by just being complacent in the position that I have and just being a figurehead and represented. And I want to be an active agent in the work of the spirit, which is being an agent for liberation for other people. I don't know if in that <laughs> there's any kind of thing that resonates with y'all. Yeah, well, I mean, I think part of what it makes me think about um, and jumping maybe to another part of the passage, um, the, the part about being, um, whether it's light or this breath of fresh air is the way that it says in the message, but, but being a community that is truly different than the world around us. Um, and sometimes it's easy to read this as, you know, Paul talking to the church and we think of the church in 21st century, you know, terms and, you know, it's this institution that's been established over, the time, over a long period of time. But of course, for the people that Paul is talking to, I mean, this is still a pretty, you know, small, um, you know, countercultural um, group that's kind of living differently, right? And he's saying, the way that you've been living, keep on living that way. So I think, you know, part of it is, is also thinking about how should the Christian community look different than the world around us? Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is how, you know, literally we should look different maybe than the, the you know, those who have um, been in power in our society and in our world. And, and this should be a place where no matter what you look like, no matter where you come from, no matter what your background is, you are part of the beloved community. You are a full, you know, participating member. You are necessary. Um, and I think that is, you know, when the world sees that, that is a breath of fresh air, right? Because that is not what our, our culture and our world teaches us. Yeah, I, I definitely reson resonate with the you matter part. Like every person matters in this space. Um, at the same time, like Jose and I have had like these conversations about like, what does it mean to be a person of color in leadership? in these spaces, right? Because yes, we matter. We should be, you know, able to serve and to use our gifts and our skills and our talents. At the same time, I think we're also holding this, okay, God has like entrusted us with a particular amount of power and privilege to a certain degree, right? What does it look like for us to serve into those spaces? At the same time, I think we've both talked about like, well, what is, how do I guard like the whole tokenism kind of piece, right? And that it's not just like, um, like a label that kind of goes over and covers things nicely, but that we're actually concerned about uh, being a part of God actually redeeming or changing or bringing about something that will be new, like, like you're saying different, right? That we as an institution would be different than other places, right? That we would actually not just say it, but we would live it and we would, um, I think honor each other differently in that, right? Which means like, okay, there is the unpacking of like the structures, there's the unpacking of the relational dynamics, which is the, I almost think the relational dynamics is actually the hardest part and it's super risky, you know? And I think that there are parts of this that, um, at least as persons of color, I, I'll speak for myself, um, as a person of color, like I'm holding the, God has entrusted me with this, amazing place to do ministry. And I love our students, faculty, and staff. Like I am so blessed to be able to be in this space. At the same time, I do have like these moments of like, okay, how do I, how do I guard against like the idea of tokenism? There have been different things I've been asked to do at certain things in the institution, um, at all levels in the institution. Sometimes it's like, we would just want a person of color to be in this, but it's not my area of expertise, right? And there's moments where I've had to say, that's such a great, you know, thought. And I would love to connect you with somebody who is a person of color who has expertise in this area because they are the people who should really speak into that, right? So I think there is kind of this, um, this balancing, I guess, of like, how do we do this in community? A acknowledging that like, we're going to make mistakes kind of going through it. This is the the rocky kinds of parts of that, I think. But that's where like, I kind of, I do lean into this, um, 
to the part in verse eight and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And I think when we think about imitating Christ, like, am I willing to put myself or allow myself to be in spaces where it's actually going to feel like, I don't know, death, but maybe sometimes death right? Like when it's compounded over time, those are things that I think we experience and we feel. And, and am I willing to? And I think that that's something for me as a person of color that I, and a woman of color at that, and a woman who's ordained at that, let's keep adding, and single, let's just keep adding them all on, right? Like as, as I hold all of those identities, God, I feel like my prayer is God, help me to continue to be willing to be in a space where I desire to want to imitate you in this, that I'm willing to die to myself, right? And I'm willing to um, ask you to do that in my life, or if I don't want to, to change me. Because <laughs> there are moments where I'm like, mm -mm, God, I don't think so. So I think um, for me, that's the living out of this passage and the tension that feels so hard, because you're wanting to hold this, like, God's called me to this. But the other part of me is like, how do I live into that in a way that um, honors God and honors the community. Yeah. yeah I think, um, I resonate with that, um, to, you know, with a lot of that as well as a woman in leadership, a woman in, you know, who's, um, in much of my career been sort of the, the only woman in the room in, in a lot of, um, places, um, for the, for the last seven years, I was the only female Dean at George Fox. And so, um, certainly, there were things that I was sometimes asked to do as the only female dean. And there was times when I was like, oh, really? You know, but there were other things where I was like, yeah, well, I, and a good example of this is um, that when I, in my first year at George Fox, they, they needed somebody from the academic side to join the Title IX team. Mm -hmm. And so, well, who should that be? Let's look around. And I was like, okay, I know you're asking me because I'm the only female dean, but at the same time, this is really important work, right? And so, yeah, it was above and beyond everything else that I had to do, but I stepped into that role. I said yes to that, even though it's hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and even though in some ways I knew that that part of the reason I was being asked to do that was because of my identity. But, but the other side of that is that I felt like I could bring my identity and my experience to that work, right? And so that I could um, make a difference by doing that work. So I know there's that tension there always, right? Between not wanting to feel um, like you're just a token, but at the same time also realizing that sometimes you get that invitation and you say, all right, this is gonna be exhausting, this is gonna be hard, but if I don't do it, then that, that voice, that experience that I bring, that perspective that I bring from my life experience won't be represented in the conversation. Mm -hmm. so, it's yeah. tough. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I, I remember uh, talking to Chaplain Lisa and we were talking about how at times, like especially when you're, uh, you know, a person of color in leadership, there's a lot of times where you're expect or you're offered to do something and you don't feel qualified for it, but you feel like there's that element of tokenism just kind of in there in that in that offer. And uh, I think part of our responsibility in, in the positions that we hold, um, you know, women, people of color and, and people who aren't typically have been offered these positions of power is to also empower others mm -hmm. and um when we're offered that i remember uh, having that conversation with chaplain lisa like if we're offered that and we feel like that's not our area of expertise we empower someone else who we know that's their area of expertise and put them in that position and we begin this process of normalizing seeing people of color women um just all types of backgrounds in these positions of power and these positions of power are just diverse and they're also working at that just universal liberation of people. And just this year, it's like heartbreak after heartbreak. But I think my prayer to God is like, God, don't normalize this heartbreak for me. Use it as motivation to where we can work together and we can use this as just this long process of just changing, trying to change the world and being naive in that process. Um, I think it's an interesting challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a good reminder in verse, I think this is 13, that the, that it is God's energy in us. Mm. Um, this energy deep within you, it says God himself willing and working in us. That gives us the ability to do the work even when it gets hard, even when there's suffering involved, as Lisa says. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, it, you know, we do that. It's that energy in us as individuals and the energy in us as a community. 
-hmm. right? As the Holy Spirit moves through our communities um, to make us, again, that breath of fresh air compared to the rest of the world. And I think there is something about doing something with the power and privilege that you individually have, right? At whatever level you are. And so for me, actually, one of the big pieces is like meeting with students like Jose, right? And having these conversations about worldview and how do you identify certain things? Um, how do you navigate that? At what point can you also then help another person do that? So it kind of really is this discipleship model, right? That we get to do this in community that, um, for me, that actually is a part of, of changing and allowing God to redeem how we do our work, how we do relationships with one another. Um, yes, some of us are like working more like on policy and trying to like think through like, what are all those pieces and how do we, um, how do we be equitable? How do we make sure that we're caring for all of the people in our institution, right? Or the people that we've been entrusted with. Um, at the same time, um, I think that God does a lot just even relationally in terms of how he shapes us individually and especially shaping our student leaders. So uh, for me, that's like, that's a huge piece, Jose, of just like having those like side conversations. And um, I think part of that is empowerment. So, you know, when we have these conversations, it's like, okay, Jose, now how are you empowering others, right? To have that same kind of conversation. Um, that I think is the redemptive reconciliation work that is actually like ongoing, right? Like that, God who began a good work in you, right? Or this will to like continue God's good, pleasing and perfect will. Um, it's this continual process and we probably, well, we won't arrive until glorification. So given that there's like, there's a lot of good stuff for God to do in us. And so um, I think that that's something that resonates with me in this passage for sure. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're back to where we started, which is um, we build up those relationships with one another, even maybe especially those people who are different from us and who disagree with us, but who can do that in love, right? Um, as we kind of start wrapping up this time, um, I would love for us to just share a little bit about how is God working in you in this passage um, or, or something that's connected to chapters one and two. Um, I think it's important for us to also be able to model and give witness and testimony uh, to the work that God is doing in our lives, right? How God is sanctifying us, um, the things that God is bringing up uh, that maybe we hadn't seen before. Um, I think that part of that is also, uh, in a sense, encouraging others to look at, oh, how might God actually be doing this in my life? And so for everyone else who is listening, part of this is also the invitation to you to say, oh, how is God actually showing up in your life? Um, if you don't, if you're not sure what that looks like, uh, maybe you're on a different journey and you're just joining us for this really great chat. Um, maybe it's something to kind of ponder, like, what does it look like for good things to be grown and changed? What does it look like for, um, for some of the things that, uh, maybe need humility at times to come out in our lives. Um, so I think for both of you, and then I'll share as well, but what, what is the invitation that maybe God has for you? How has God been working in your life? Jose, you want to go first? Yeah, I'd love to go first. Um, I think for me, it kind of comes back to the point where how can I be more than just a person of color in leadership? How can I how can I be more than just a Latinx man that's the ASSP president? And how can I actually, you know, bring forth change in a way that's substantial and that I'm not being used for just representation? And how can I bridge that gap? And it's something that I'm still working out. And it's, it's at times difficult because you do get tired and you do, you know, because it's work. And I think a lot of the times we think of humility as just something that's a thought something in the theoretical but it's actually more practical and and used in that work and um just praying that god gives me strength <laughs> in that yeah thank you um yeah for me i mean this is a really interesting time to step into a, a leadership role um of this level um and so i've been really um sort of trying to be open to understanding you know why God now? Why me? Why here? Um, and, you know, and I, and I do think that um, a lot of what we've been talking about in terms of some of the ways that we are, that our society is finally having conversations about racial justice um, is an important piece of that. So I've been really thinking about, so what does it mean to be, a, a, you know, a white person, a white woman in, 
in, in a position of power um, at this time and in this institution where we need to do work on equity. You know, I think there is a lot of good things happening here already. I mean, I don't think we're starting from scratch, but we have a long way to go, right? And so how can I um, come to know this institution and then figure out um, where I might be able to be involved in leading the community um, in change um, in ways that will benefit um, all of the students and um, as well as faculty and staff who are working here. So it is, it's, a, it's actually a, a pretty humbling um, proposition to think about um, leading an institution uh, through change. Um, so I'm just trying to stay attentive to um, you know, they own my own work that I have to just do in my own life um, and then allowing the, the work of leadership to kind of grow out of that, that work that God is doing in me um, to examine who I am in Christ and who uh, and where I get my, my sense of, um, of, uh, of belonging and um, my sense of empowerment. Mm -hmm. I like guess my question is such a hard question. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think there's a couple levels for me. So first professionally, um, I think from the time that I came in, I really wanted to take a look at my team, you know, and um, I'm so grateful. I have an awesome team. I love my team. Uh, we're quite diverse and have been and are continuing to grow in uh, many different facets of diversity. Um, but I think one of the things that became really important for me to take a look at is um, how, how, do, how do they not just function and interact in the institution, but like even like, um, like what, what does their voice look like in these spaces? How can I empower them so that they can flourish? And are there hindrances or roadblocks that are keeping them from being able to really flourish and thrive? And so I think part of like my responsibility and my job is to really take a look at like, are there places that this kind of redemptive ministry, right? Like this um, being able to serve in these capacities and uh, make space for students, especially, are there things that are like roadblocks for my team? And how can I go in and help to clear the path for some of those things so that my team can really kind of step in and lead into these spaces, right? Of reconciliation, of, um, of, of like living into this Christ humility piece, right? Um, I think there is something that's stirring in me and that continues to stir in me for that. So that's something I'm definitely always mindful of and always trying to like work towards. Uh, personally, oh man, this passage is painful. <laughs> um, you know, I feel like sometimes when God starts working things on your life, like it pops up all the time in all these different facets of your life. And you know, God's permissive will is a funny thing. And so I, I feel like it's been popping up in a lot of my personal relationships. And I've had to find myself in a space where I'm doing a lot of apologizing. Um, and it's not just apologizing, but it is a choosing to lower myself, um, sometimes even up under my friends to a certain degree, um, to hear things differently than I would have heard if I was just being my normal self, you know? Um, I feel like I've been asking the spirit to make my heart sensitive to hear and see things that I hadn't seen before. And that is like, it's a painful process because you just see like how messed up you are sometimes um, and how you can have really good intentions, but you hurt other people and other people hurt you. Oh my gosh, it's totally happening in my life right now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and it's happening a lot. And so I think for me, when I look at my life, I say, God, are there themes that you're popping up? And I think this, chapters one and two really are just kind of popping up in my life in different ways. And so um, I often say this, um, I think we look for God, how are you working and how do I cooperate with the work you're already doing? And I think that that would be my invitation to our community. Like how is God actually working on our campus already? Cause God is here. God is working and moving in us individually and as an institution. And so then the question becomes, God, how do we cooperate and move with you in that? And that's going to look different for everybody. And that's an awesome thing, right? So our job is to stay open and sensitive to how God is working and moving and then being willing to step in, in places of sacrifice, 
being willing to lower ourselves in places where God might be calling for that, right? Willing to empower others into different spaces at times. Uh, but I think that it really is the work of the spirit helping us to discern that in Christ, right? Like that's what makes us family. And that's what I think, you know, Dr. Hartley, you were saying this, like this is what should make us different in the city of Seattle, right? Like our institution, because we know Christ, because we love Christ, even though it's messy, because God never said it wasn't going to be messy, you know, um, this is what it looks like to live out that love abounding. And so um, I'm grateful that we get a chance to work that out in an institution like SPU, because that's not the case everywhere in every other institution in America, right? And so we do, I think, have a gift and a privilege of having Christ that finds us so that we can actually delve in because we trust that Jesus died on the cross <laughs> and it is not our own work that we receive and that we can also receive from one another. So, um, yeah, so I think these are the things that I'm holding. I'm grateful I get to hold it with both of you and with others in our institution. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of this, for using your voice. Um, Dr. Hartley, we're so glad that you have joined us. I'm really excited to see what God will do in the future. And Jose, I'm a big fan, you know, so I appreciate your voice in this space and your willingness because I know that you've asked a lot of these questions in other spaces. And so um, your courage and willingness to be able to put it on the table, um, I really appreciate you giving yourself to the community in this way. So thank you very much for joining us. Everyone out there, we're so glad that you got to sit in on our conversation. Um, let's continue the conversation and do this together in community. We'll look forward to seeing you next time in chapel. <laughs>